Welcome everyone, today we're discussing neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's a rare but serious condition that can happen with certain medications. And it's something that every healthcare provider needs to be aware of. Absolutely. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome can be life-threatening, so early recognition is critical. Right. We need to be able to spot it and act fast. So to understand it better, let's start with a real-world case. Let's say we have a 45-year-old woman who's been hospitalized for agitation and insomnia. Okay. So imagine this woman, she's admitted, and she receives heliparidol, 5 milligrams intramuscularly, twice a day. Along with that, she's also given lorazepam, two milligrams, also twice a day. And this helps to calm her down initially. Yes, initially it does. But then, just 38 hours later, she developed a fever. And it doesn't go down. It stays above 38.3 degrees Celsius. That's a pretty quick turnaround. Is that typical for neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Yes, that's a classic timeline for this syndrome to develop. It can appear very quickly. And what other symptoms does she start showing along with the fever? Well, along with the persistent fever, she also develops rigid muscles, almost like they're locked in place. Wow, so she's experiencing both fever and muscle rigidity. What else? Her mental state changes, she becomes confused, she's sweating profusely, and her breathing becomes rapid. Those are some serious symptoms. Did they do any lab tests at this point? Yes, they did. Her creatinine level came back at 1.6 milligrams per deciliter. But the most alarming result was her creatine phosphokinase. It was incredibly high, at 5,919 international units per liter. That's quite a jump. What does a creatine phosphokinase level that high indicate? That indicates significant muscle breakdown. It's a hallmark sign of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So putting it all together, the doctors, after considering everything, diagnosed her with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Exactly. And this case really highlights the importance of a thorough assessment, doesn't it? Absolutely. Missing this diagnosis could have serious consequences for the patient. So let's break this down. What exactly is going on in neuroleptic malignant syndrome? At its core, it's all about dopamine. The medications that trigger neuroleptic malignant syndrome work by blocking dopamine in the brain. Okay, and dopamine is a neurotransmitter, right? It plays a role in a lot of different functions of the body. So what happens when dopamine is blocked? Well, a lot of things start to go wrong. Think of it like this. Your body's temperature control system malfunctions. It's like your internal thermostat breaks and you can't regulate heat properly. Ah, so that explains the fever. What about the muscle rigidity and the other symptoms? The muscle rigidity is a direct result of the dopamine blockade. The muscles essentially become very stiff, almost frozen in place. And this is what leads to that characteristic rigidity. Okay, that makes sense. And the rapid breathing, the sweating, how do those fit into the picture? Those are related to the autonomic nervous system, which controls things like breathing, heart rate, and other automatic functions. When dopamine is blocked, it throws the autonomic nervous system into disarray. So it all comes back to that dopamine blockade. Which medications are usually the main culprits here? Antipsychotic medications are often involved. Hiloperidol, the one we mentioned in the case, is a common one. Other typical antipsychotics like chlorpromazine and flufenazine can also cause this. Right, those are the older antipsychotics. What about the newer ones, the atypical antipsychotics? Are those any safer? Not necessarily. Atypical antipsychotics can also trigger neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Medications like olanzapine, risperidone, and ketiapine all fall into this category. So it's not just limited to antipsychotics then? That's right. Any medication that affects dopamine has the potential to cause this. Some antidepressants can do it. And even medications like metoclopramide, which is used for nausea and vomiting, can be a trigger. So a pretty wide range of medications can be involved. What about medications that increase dopamine levels? Could those play a role? Absolutely. Abruptly stopping medications that increase dopamine can also bring on neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Think of the medications used for Parkinson's disease, like levodopa. It's the sudden shift in dopamine levels that seems to be the problem. It sounds like a lot of medications can potentially be involved. Are there any factors that can help us determine who might be at higher risk of developing this? Yeah, there are definitely some risk factors to keep in mind. High doses of these medications or rapid increases in dosage are certainly riskier. And the way the medication is given also matters. Intravenous or intramuscular administration tends to increase the risk. So the way we prescribe and administer these medications is really important. What other factors should we be considering? Dehydration is a major risk factor. Pre-existing mental health conditions can also increase the risk. And there's a genetic component as well. Some individuals may be predisposed to this reaction. So it's a combination of factors. The medication itself, the way it's given, the patient's overall health, and maybe even their genes. 
Okay, so let's say we're evaluating a patient. What are the red flags, the signs and symptoms that should make us think of neuroleptic malignant syndrome? The first thing to look for is a high fever, typically above 38 degrees Celsius. And then you'll notice severe muscle stiffness. It's almost as though their muscles are locked up. So fever and rigidity are key. What about mental status? Are there any changes there that we should be watching for? Absolutely. You want to be on the lookout for any changes in mental status. It could be anything from confusion to complete unresponsiveness. These are serious warning signs. Okay, and we talked earlier about the autonomic nervous system being affected. How does that actually manifest in terms of symptoms? What are we looking for? You'll see a variety of things. A rapid heartbeat is common. Blood pressure can be either high or low. There's often profuse sweating. The patient might struggle to swallow. And in some cases, they even lose bladder control. Wow, so quite a range of symptoms. Are there any specific lab tests we should order if we suspect neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Yes, definitely. Creatine phoscokinase is an important one. This enzyme is released when muscles are damaged. So if you see levels over 1,000 international units per liter, that's a big red flag. Besides elevated creatine phosphokinase, what else might we see in the lab results? You might also see an elevated white blood cell count. And it's important to watch for signs of kidney problems. These can sometimes develop as well. So we need to be really thorough in our assessment. Now, I know that neuroleptic malignant syndrome can sometimes look like other conditions. So we need to be careful about our diagnosis, right? You're absolutely right. It's crucial to consider other possibilities and rule them out. Serotonin syndrome, for instance, can share some similar features. Right. Serotonin syndrome, that's caused by having too much serotonin in the body, right? Certain antidepressants can cause that. Exactly. And like neuroleptic malignant syndrome, serotonin syndrome can also cause fever, mental status changes, and autonomic nervous system dysfunction. But there are some key differences. So how can we tell them apart? What should we be looking for? One of the big giveaways for serotonin syndrome is hyperreflexia and clonus. These are involuntary muscle contractions. You won't typically see these in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So those neurological signs can help us differentiate. What other conditions should we keep in mind? What else could potentially mimic neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Well, malignant hyperthermia is another one to consider. It's a rare but life-threatening reaction that can occur with certain anesthetic agents. Malignant hyperthermia. Remind me, what are the key features of that? Malignant hyperthermia typically presents with a rapid rise in body temperature, severe muscle rigidity, and a fast heart rate. It usually happens during or shortly after surgery. So the timing is important there. If it happens in the context of anesthesia, malignant hyperthermia should be high on our list. What else should we be thinking about? Well, don't forget about infections. Infections that affect the central nervous system can also cause fever, mental status changes, and even muscle rigidity. So an infection could potentially present very similarly to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Anything else we should be considering? Metabolic disorders can sometimes mimic neuroleptic malignant syndrome as well. For example, thyroid storm can present with a similar constellation of symptoms. Okay, so we need to be thinking about infections, metabolic issues. It seems like we need to cast a wide net and consider a lot of different possibilities. Absolutely. A good history and a thorough physical examination are essential. And then we need to order specific lab tests to help us narrow down the diagnosis and rule out other conditions. Okay, so let's say we've gone through everything and we strongly suspect neuroleptic malignant syndrome. What's the first step in managing this condition? The most important thing is to immediately stop the offending medication. This is absolutely crucial. There's no time to waste. And then we shift our focus to supportive care. What exactly does supportive care involve in this situation? Supportive care means addressing the patient's symptoms and keeping them stable. We need to hydrate them aggressively with intravenous fluids. We need to cool them down using things like cooling blankets and acetaminophen to help lower the fever. What if the patient starts having trouble breathing? How do we manage that? Respiratory distress is a serious complication. If it develops, we need to act quickly. It might require intubation and mechanical ventilation to support their breathing. It sounds like we might need to involve a whole team of specialists to manage a case like this. You're absolutely right. This is a complex condition that often requires a multidisciplinary approach. We might need intensivists, neurologists, psychiatrists, and pharmacists all working together. So a real team effort. Now, besides supportive care, are there any medications we can use specifically to treat neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Yes, there are, but these medications are typically reserved for severe cases, and they're targeted at specific symptoms. You mentioned dopamine agonists earlier. Can you remind me how those work and why they might be helpful here? Sure. 
Dopamine agonists like bromocryptine work by mimicking the effects of dopamine in the brain so they can help restore some of that dopamine activity that's been lost. We usually start with a low dose and gradually increase it as needed. Okay, that makes sense. What about muscle relaxants? When would we consider using those? Muscle relaxants, like dantrolene, are helpful for addressing the muscle rigidity that's so characteristic of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. They can make the patient more comfortable and potentially prevent complications like rhabdomyolysis. And what about benzodiazepines? What role do they play in managing this condition? Benzodiazepines, like lorazepam, are often used to manage agitation and anxiety. These are common symptoms in neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and benzodiazepines can help calm the patient down. So we have a few different medication options that we can use depending on the specific symptoms the patient is experiencing. And of course, we always need to tailor the treatment plan to the individual patient, taking into account their overall health and any other medications they might be taking. Exactly. It's all about individualized care. We need to consider potential drug interactions and contraindications. Patient safety is paramount. So let's talk about prognosis. What can we expect for patients who develop neuroleptic malignant syndrome? What are their chances of making a full recovery? The good news is that with prompt recognition and proper management, most patients with neuroleptic malignant syndrome do recover fully. However, we can't emphasize enough how important it is to act quickly. Early recognition and intervention are key to a good outcome. That is reassuring to hear. But even if someone makes a full recovery, are there any potential long-term effects we should be aware of? Yes, unfortunately, in some cases, there can be some lasting consequences. What kind of complications might we see? Well, one concern is rhabdomyolysis, the muscle breakdown we talked about earlier. If it's severe, it can lead to kidney damage. When muscles break down, they release toxins that can harm the kidneys. So that's definitely something we want to prevent. Absolutely. And respiratory failure, if it occurs, can sometimes cause permanent lung injury. Again, timely and effective management is essential to minimize these risks. Okay, so kidney problems, lung problems. Are there any potential cognitive effects? Yes, some patients experience cognitive impairments following an episode of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Things like problems with thinking and memory, and sometimes psychiatric problems can develop as well. So this syndrome can really have a significant impact on a person's life, even after they recover from the acute episode. What about the risk of recurrence? Could it happen again once someone has had neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Recurrence is definitely a risk. It can happen if the patient is exposed to the same medication that triggered it initially. So how can we prevent future episodes? The most effective way to prevent recurrence is to avoid using the medication that caused it in the first place. But what if that medication is absolutely necessary for the patient's treatment? What if there are no other options? If we absolutely have to use the same medication again, we need to proceed with extreme caution. We'd start with a very low dose and increase it very slowly, monitoring the patient very closely for any signs or symptoms. So in those situations, really careful monitoring is crucial, and we need to have a thorough discussion with the patient, explaining the risks and benefits very clearly. Absolutely. The patient needs to be fully informed and involved in the decision-making process. So to wrap up, what are some of the key takeaways for our listeners? What do we really want them to remember about neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Well, first and foremost, remember that neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a serious condition, but it's rare. Early recognition and prompt treatment are essential for the best possible outcome. And we can't just focus on the obvious. We need to think broadly and consider other conditions that might mimic it. Exactly. Always consider the possibility of neuroleptic malignant syndrome in any patient who develops fever, muscle rigidity, mental status changes, and autonomic dysfunction, especially if they're taking medications that block dopamine. Great advice. A thorough assessment is critical. And if we do diagnose neuroleptic malignant syndrome, we need to act fast. Stop the offending medication, provide aggressive supportive care, and consider medications to target specific symptoms. You've got it. I think we covered it well. I think so, too. It was a great discussion. Thank you for joining me. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, Feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.